Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. I'm Yasha, if you're new here, and today I wanted to talk about all of the radiology subspecialties. I haven't seen an overview of all of the radiology subspecialties and all of the different things that we do um, anywhere on the internet, so I thought today I would record my own. Okay, so I actually made a PowerPoint for this video because I really wanted to talk about these subspecialties and didn't want to forget anything. So yeah, this is my little presentation on um, radiology subspecialties. So there are really 10 that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, body, MSK, which is musculoskeletal. Uh, body is also abdominal. Neuroradiology, neurointerventional, interventional, breast imaging, nuclear medicine, and then the kind of umbrella of chest, which can kind of include either just chest, or thoracic, it's kind of interchangeable words. Um, cardiothoracic is another thing you might hear. Cardiovascular is another thing you might hear. They're all kind of the same um, umbrella. And then there's pediatric radiology and then emergency radiology. So we're, we're gonna sort of go through all of these in a little bit more detail. And um, just remember that there is overlap between all of these in the sense that not there is no one study that is only read by one type of radiologist. Everything is kind of very fluid. And also depending where you practice, you might be reading one or more of these things and you might, yeah, everything is just practice dependent, I guess I should say. Practice and location and subspecialty and institution dependent. Radiology is very fluid. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is abdominal or body imaging, which is probably the most general of the subspecialties. So the most common types of studies that you'll see in body imaging really include kind of anything that includes the abdomen and pelvis. So CT, um, MR, of course, there's always plain film. I haven't written plain film on all of the, all of the um, slides, but plain film or just a general chest x-ray is pretty much included on most of these. Fluoroscopy is also something that's kind of specific to body, not specific to body, but very common in body because you're doing a lot of esophagrams, you're doing a lot of swallow studies, you're doing a lot of upper and lower GIs, even like enemas, for example, barium enemas, um, a lot of things to diagnose things that are going, that are in the GI tract. So a lot of that is done fluoroscopically. So fluoro is a big component of body imaging. And of course, there's always abdomen and pelvic ultrasound. So a lot of liver lesions, a lot of um, gallbladder pathology, renal, et cetera, all of those things can be assessed with, the, with ultrasound. And then kind of similarly in the pelvis, you also have ultrasound to help us with the ovaries, with the uterus, with you know, female reproductive organs, even like the GU tract. So even like the bladder, for example, can is commonly assessed on ultrasound. So Again, none of this is all encompassing. It's just kind of what are the most common things? What One thing that I really like about body is that you do a lot of pelvic MR for like things that ail women. So for me, I'm really interested in women's imaging, for example. So, you know, fibroids can be characterized on MR. Endometriosis commonly is an indication for a pelvic MR. And of course, any pelvic ultrasound. So a lot of times even like OB can fall under this. Um, anything that, has, you know, ails the ovaries or the uterus, like I said. So I really appreciate it for that reason as well. So just remember that you can kind of, there are offshoots of all of these different um, specialties and you can really tailor your practice to whatever it is you want, depending where you work. The setting, so it's usually an inpatient setting, but but body imaging is also commonly seen in teleradiology. There are kind of a few subspecialties that take to tele really well and body is one of them, just because it is so general. As far as procedures and patient contact, the body imagers, depending where you work, often do a lot of the biopsies, like in the liver, for example, gallbladder tubes, coli tubes, and then of course, fluoro is always patient interaction because you are handling the fluoro machine and telling the patient what you would like them to do, changing position, et cetera. So that's all um, under body imaging. The next is MSK, which is one of the, it's a very common um, subspecialty, musculoskeletal imaging. And a lot of people that originally like orthopedic surgery end up going into MSK because if you don't like the OR, for example, then this can be a nice way to still see the same pathologies, but you're actually seeing it on imaging instead. Um, I didn't include the fact that you also do a lot of imaging of like prostheses, but that's another part of MSK. A lot of the times you're assessing things with plain film. So x-ray, you know, um, fractures, for example, you do on x-ray joint MR, so shoulder MR, rotator cuff tears, right? ACL tears, like you're seeing in this image, um, hip 
labral tears, meniscal tears, et cetera. All of that is assessed on MR. And then of course you can do CT and MR arthrograms. So you can really see if there is a labral tear, if there really is a, um, yeah, labral tear is what I was looking at. Like, what is the word? But it is labral tear that I'm thinking of. And so all of that will be done with arthrograms. And you're actually the person who's injecting the contrast into the shoulder or into the knee or whatever, wherever you're doing hip. And then you're, um, I, should, I shouldn't say knee, we don't really do that as much, but the hip and the shoulder. And then you're also imaging those right afterwards. And then you're gonna give the patient the diagnosis. Again, in terms of setting, this is commonly done inpatient, but MSK is also commonly done in tele because you can imagine there's a lot of trauma that can be under MSK imaging, lots of fractures, lots of, you know, all of those types of polytrauma. So tele radiology kind of suits that aspect of MSK imaging. And then there are lots of procedures in MSK, all of the arthrograms, like I said, you're injecting the contrast and then steroid injections, patients often come back often, they come back often for steroid injections. And uh, we do that under fluoroscopic guidance most of the time. Oh, and I should also include that there are joint aspirations that are also done by MSK radiology. Neuro, I think neuro is actually the most common specialty in radiology. Types of studies include anything head and neck, um, head and neck, brain, spine. Those are probably the most important. And then I think a huge portion of what neuroradiologists do are stroke imaging. So a lot of times you're working very closely with neurology. And then if you have a brain tumor or something, you, you will work closely with neurosurgery as well to kind of help with um, localization or characterization of tumors. Um, in terms of setting, so inpatient, again, most common, but I think neuro is very commonly utilized in the teleradiology setting because of the stroke imaging, emergencies, et cetera, uh, cord compressions, things like that. So very common. If you are interested in tele, then neuro can be a good, um, a good way for you to get there. There are some procedures in Neuroradiology, I think LPs are probably the most common. And then of course you can do myelograms where you're injecting contrast into the fecal sac essentially. So just um, something to consider, but this is the most common and neuro is very complicated. I think fellowships can be one year, but are oftentimes two years. So something to consider as well. Most of these are one year. And then an offshoot and further training after the year, one or two years of neuro, neuro radiology would be neurointerventional radiology, if that's something that you're interested in. So I will say that neuroradiology will do LPs, myelograms, but if you want to do more advanced procedures like cerebral angiography, which is what this picture is showing, then you would have to do an additional fellowship in neurointerventional. A lot of these um, neurointerventionalists are the people that come in when there is a stroke and there is an indication to remove the clot kind of in a more invasive manner. You actually have to mechanically remove it. That would be a neurointerventionalist that comes in and does that. They do angiograms, they treat AV malformations, they treat aneurysms, they, they do lots more than just this. Even um, some people will have ways to treat brain tumors, for example, or neuro-oncology. So there are a lot of procedures that I obviously haven't mentioned, but these are probably the most common that you would see a neurointerventionalist do. This would obviously have to be inpatient. And um, basically anything that's a primarily procedural, like neurointerventional or interventional radiology, you will have lots of patient contact. That brings me into just regular interventional radiology, which does not require the neuro pathway. This is its own um, fellowship after radiology. I think the most bread and butter things that interventional radiologists do are paras and thoras, paracentesis, thoracentesis, and of course, biopsies of just about anything. Uh, more advanced things include TIPS, um, vascular studies, again, just depending, vascular intervention is just more dependent on your practice setting. Like some places, vascular surgery will do that. Some places, IR will do those things. Ports, picks, central lines, et cetera. Those are again, bread and butter. Something I wanted to specifically mention are, is like interventional oncology and also uh, uterine fibroid embolization. So some people do have an outpatient um, fibroid clinic, for example, where you are just ablating fibroids all day, not ablating, but embolizing fibroids all day. So if you are interested in women's health, this can be another way to kind of go about that. As far as setting goes, most of these interventional radiologists do work inpatient where you're doing parasauras, et cetera, in the radiology department in the hospital. But there are some outpatient um, interventional radiologists who primarily will do fibroids or vascular like vein ablations, things like that. And then of course, all of anything that is primarily procedural will have lots of patient contact, especially with paras and thoras, biopsies, et cetera. You might even see patients that are coming in kind of more commonly. So you might even make a longitudinal relationship with them. And I also include multidisciplinary conferences because a lot of interventionalists will attend many 
um, multidisciplinary conferences to kind of give their input on what IR can provide for a patient that's being presented. My personal favorite, breast imaging, is another subspecialty of radiology that is very high in procedures and patient contact. Primarily, we do screening and diagnostic mammograms. That's probably the bulk of what we do, but there's also breast MR, breast ultrasound. So you, you do dedicated breast ultrasound, kind of limited breast ultrasound, but also screening breast ultrasound. There are lots of things that are up and coming in terms of radiopharmaceuticals that can be utilized in breast imaging, as well as um, contrast enhanced mammography is something new that's coming up. It's, it's, it exists, but it's becoming more and more common. Um, in terms of the setting, I would say that most breast imagers work in, well, most pro, like solely breast imagers work in the outpatient center, in outpatient centers that are in the breast center. Many breast centers are in the hospital, but it's more of a clinic setting. It's more of an outpatient setting, even if it is within the hospital. And in terms of things that we do, Lots of breast biopsies, whether that's under ultrasound guidance, MRI guidance, stereotactic, which is basically mammo guidance. Um, we do a lot of patient education in terms of breast density and what our reports mean, et cetera. And then of course, breaking bad news. So telling patients that you are concerned about cancer, for example, is kind of one of the more common things that we talk about. And um, breast imagers also do multidisciplinary conferences. I would say that that's a big part of what we do. And even at our hospital, which is a more community-based hospital, we do a weekly breast dedicated tumor board. So a lot of conferences for breast imagers. Nuclear medicine is another subspecialty of radiology. You used to be able to do nuclear medicine as a standalone residency. That really, that option exists less and less. I think there are only a handful now of residencies that exist for nuclear medicine outside of radiology. Um, the most common studies that we do would be like PET CT scans. So I'm sure that Everyone has either seen or heard of a PET CT, which is primarily used for cancer staging, but has other indications as well. Um, again, another common thing that we do as nuclear medicine physicians would be thyroid uptake studies. So commonly getting referrals from um, endocrinology, for example, to help people with either thyroid cancer or, um, or Graves disease, for example, looking at not thyroid nodules, things like that. Other things are VQ scans, GI bleed. Things, these are things that you might've heard about in medical school, but there are tons of studies that um, nuclear medicine does, white blood cell scans, um, bone scans. I think I should have probably included that, but looking for metastatic disease to the entire body. This is all usually done in an inpatient setting. And as far as procedures, I think there are, it's usually, it's less, patient contact than other radiology subspecialties, but you still do have occasional um, patient contact. So I would say lymphocentigraphy might be the most common that we would do, which is looking for a sentinel node, helping the surgeons out in the OR. You're not going to the OR, you do this before the patient goes to the OR, but that's the purpose of it. And um, thyroid ablations, you have a long consent that you have to go through every time that you give a patient a radiopharmaceutical, such as for, for thyroid ablation. So that can be also seen as like patient contact, but overall less than other radiology subspecialties. So now the umbrella of chest radiology, which, in, which can include thoracic, cardiothoracic, cardiac, cardiovascular, et cetera. Um, chest x-ray, I feel like everyone reads chest x-ray, so I really didn't even want to include it here, but I also don't want someone to feel like it was left out. So there you go. Um, chest CT, I, would, I added lung cancer screening only because that's kind of one of the newer and more like common indications that we are seeing now for chest CT is lung cancer screening. So you can play a part in um, kind of public health in that way. Cardiac CT, cardiac MR, really interesting studies that are happening at a more high level. And I think have a lot of potential in the sense that, you know, cardiac disease is what kills most Americans these days. And so this has a big impact on um, public health as well. And then coronary CTA. So if someone has chest pain, you know, they can come in and get a coronary CT if they don't necessarily qualify directly for a cath catheterization. This is all usually primarily done inpatient procedures and patient contact. Again, I think overall less than other radiology subspecialties. I know at some institutions, the chest radiologists do the lung biopsies. I don't know how common that is, but it's possible. And then of course, if you are doing a coronary CTA, sometimes you do have to go down and monitor these studies. You have to talk to the patient and sometimes you have to give them um, some medication in order to help their heart rate stay in the optimal um, zone for our studies. But again, overall much, much less, I would say than some of the other subspecialties.
Pediatric radiology is another subspecialty of radiology, which is basically you are a generalist, but for children. So most commonly these radiologists work at children's hospitals if you are looking to do 100% pediatrics. But of course there are pediatric radiologists that work in private practice. You just may not be doing 100% peds. Um, in terms of like what types of studies they do, I think overall there is less cross-sectional imaging in pediatrics. First of all, the population is a lot less. And then of course you are trying to reduce radiation. Babies also have a hard time staying still for MR. There isn't, you know, um, radiation that's involved with MR, but still it can be difficult for them to stay still for the long, long studies. So that's why there's overall just less cross-sectional imaging, which includes CT and MR in peds. And there's a lot more plain film and ultrasound lots of ultrasound. There's also a pretty good amount of fluoros fluoroscopy. Uh, a lot of the things that are diagnosed in pediatric and you know babies is diagnosed via fluoro. So that's something that's pretty common. And a lot of times you can do additional training to do fetal MR or, or obstetric imaging. So that can be an offshoot of peds if that's something that you're interested in. There's also an entire specialty dedicated to pediatric neuroradiology, which, which you know, um, requires one extra year of fellowship as well. And you can do that via neuroradiology or peds. You can choose either way. Like I said, children's hospitals are the most common, which is, would be an inpatient setting. And there is a lot of patient contact in pediatric radiology because you often have a lot of worried parents that come in. Um, the fluoro is pretty much always done. You're always in the room for the fluoro study. You're handling the machine, you're handling the child, et cetera. And then you're also um, doing a lot of hands-on ultrasound. You pretty much always go in for any ultrasound, especially with like really young children or whatever it may be, parents have questions. And so there's just a lot more uh, patient contact in pediatrics. And I think this is the last one that I'm gonna talk about, emergency radiology, which is probably the least common of the ones that I've seen so far, but I could be wrong about that. That's just anecdotal. Um, and basically you are working in the ED. It is its own fellowship. You're working primarily in the ED. And I would say this is also very commonly utilized in teleradiology um, settings because those are often overnight type of uh, positions. And so, yeah, teleradiology, inpatient, in the ER, that's really where you'll find emergency radiologists. They read basically anything that's emergent or trauma related. So stroke imaging is emergent, lots of plain film because there's lots of polytrauma that comes through. And of course, chest, body, CT, and PEs. Um, sometimes you'll have runoffs, for example, of the lower extremities, which is basically vascular imaging of your lower extremities. If you have really horrible trauma, you might just pan scan and you have to read the entire body. So it just depends, you know, what comes through the ER and you're pretty much responsible for reading that. In terms of procedures and patient contact, I would say overall it's less because you have other people that are taking care of the patients on the other side of the wall. Um, you're not really doing a lot of procedures in the ER. The, the ER doctors mostly take care of that. And But of course, it's practice dependent. It's institution dependent. So there may be some practices where the emergency radiologist does go and do some procedures. I just, I, I don't know. Um, but this is kind of more niche, I would say, definitely more in academic institutions where there is a dedicated emergency reading room and someone who would do 100% emergency radiology. So just depends where you work. And I would also say that a lot of times the overnight shifts are covered by emergency radiologists. So if you are looking for like seven days on, 14 days off type of type of like practice, um, emergency could be a good way for you to go. So I hope that was kind of not too rambly and that sort of makes sense. My kind of closing thoughts are just, just that there is a lot of overlap between subspecialties. Like it's not like chest radiologists are the only ones who read PE studies and nobody else does. Um, there's lots of overlap between all of these. And especially in radiology, there is really no silo. Like everyone is kind of reading everything and it just depends where you work and what your practice looks like that you might be reading some things and not others. And a lot of it is dictated by what your practice needs from you. So if you have one cardiac imager and you need someone else, and even if you're like a neuroradiologist, you might be asked to you know, read cardiac studies. It just depends what your practice needs. There's a lot of difference between academics and private practice. In general, academics um, tends to be more subspecialized. So you may really only be reading like neuro, neuro radiology and you may not read anything else for it, your entire career. But if you're in private practice, you might be reading neuro one day, you might be reading body, you might be reading everything all in one day. So it just depends where you work and what setting you're looking for. 
the practice setting is also flexible oftentimes. So say that you are looking for something very specific, oftentimes you can find that. So if you want to be in private practice, but you want to only practice one thing, I'm sure that you'll be able to find that type of setting. If you want to be able to work from home, you'll probably be able to find that. But there's always like give and take. So you might have to compromise when it comes to what you want to read. And there's always like, um, institution specific kind of turf wars that go on in terms of who does what procedures. So G tubes could be totally done by IR in one place, but they might be done by surgery or they might be done by GI at another place. It just depends like where you work. And that can also be different institution to institution. So you may go through, you know, various institutions during your career and you might find places that have, um, you might be doing G-tubes at one place and not at another. So in general, everything is very specific to the practice that you're working at. And so if you are someone who wants to do only one thing, that's just something to consider that you might just have to seek that out um, and make sure that you look in your contract and make sure you understand the practice before you sign. Anyways, I don't want to ramble too much. I hope this was kind of a helpful overview of radiology. Please comment below. I'll try to answer as many comments as I can if there are questions about any of these things. And um, yeah, I will see you all in the next one. Thanks for watching.